Yeah, I think I could wish you were not. Oh, we have to read. No, we don't. Actually, I was going to. Can you slide? I can introduce myself to my students. Yeah, you can introduce yourself. Okay, but I'll let you see if I'm making more. Yeah, it just actually doesn't get a Okay. Great. Thank you for having me. You can introduce me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess we'll get started. Thank you, everyone, for joining. It's my very great pleasure to have Bill Freeman today here. I was going to introduce him, but he said he's going to introduce himself. I'm going to just tell you, uh, he's done so much amazing stuff. One of them, he's not going to talk today about it, but I encourage you to look at the tech talk. He used the moon as a telescope or to image the earth. And then that can be applied to seeing invisible or things that we think are invisible, but are not. So he's not gonna talk about it, but I found it super cool. We know him in this community. He is more famous for having supervised Katie Bowman's uh, work on the on the, the first image of M87. So Bill Freeman was heavily involved in that. And I will let then you introduce yourself. Great, hi. Um, thanks. I'm really glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah, just on the moon project, this is a, a white whale project that I haven't succeeded at. And it's not science, it's science outreach, really. But I want to use the moon as a teles as a camera, like the, near the new moon, when it's illuminated most visibly by earth shine. And I've always thought there's got to be some way you could look at the earth shine, shine and reconstruct an image of the earth from the moon. And, and I've, I've wanted to do that for a long time. I've come up with several different methods to do it, all of which are about a factor of 10 away from feasible. Um, but if this uh, excites you, you know, I'd be happy to talk with you about it later. Um, and it, as, as um, Cecilia said, it, it has led to some offshoots in computational imaging. So it's been a, kind of a, a, a muse for me, even though it hasn't worked out yet. Um, OK, so I have this small set of slides I, I show at the beginning of class uh, every semester just to introduce myself to my students. I thought I'd do that here since you don't know me either. Um, it turns out my entire work history can be shown on this little map of, of Tech Square in Cambridge, okay? So um, I first started out as, a, as an electrical engineer doing electronic imaging work at Polaroid. Polaroid is a now defunct corporation, but it used to be a big deal with cameras. So I worked on um, electronic imaging. I, this, this dates myself, but what the heck? This is an Apple IIe computer. And, um, and at that time, you couldn't get color hard copy from, from your computer. And so Polaroid said, well, hey, let's take a black and white monitor, put color filter wheel in there, and take Polaroid film in there and make color prints from your PC that way. And so I worked on that product. Um, and, and then they also made an electronic camera. And um, I'm going to talk about this actually in the, in the talk, but um, you know, I worked on the problem of given a set of one color sample per position, how, what's the best way to reconstruct three color samples per position uh, for an electronic camera? And that went into their product too. Um, then this is the one thing on the, my work pass, which doesn't fit on that little map. My wife and I wanted to live in a foreign country for a year before we started having kids. So we went to China for a year, 1987, 1988. Um, I worked at and uh, was a foreign expert there. Um, and you know they treated us really well. Here I am on the family bicycle, eating the cafeteria. Um, they gave me this really nice office, you know, just, <laughs> just only for, for me. Um, and then, okay, then I came back and I went to grad school. I went to the Media Lab, worked with Ted Adelson. Um, and I studied kind of low level vision, developed this technique called steerable filters for doing oriented filtering in images, um, use it to find edges and contours. Okay, then um, by then it was clear to me that my wife didn't want to leave the Boston area. So my, my whole career had to be here, really. Um, so I went up to Mitsubishi Electric Research Labs and worked there for nine years. And it was a lab that had just opened. It was like just the right time to be at an industrial lab because to hire people, they had to say, okay, you can do whatever you want when you come here. So I got to stay involved in academia and I made a TV set you could control the pan signals. So 
gives me, if you hold up your hand, uh, this on this overlay, graphics overlay goes on the TV set and a little icon that tracks your hand motion and then you can use your hand like a mouse. Um, and you make interactive computer games. So there's a camera here, which is looking at the person who's pantomiming running and the faster he pantomimes running, the faster the character in the game runs. And you can tell what time this was made though, because notice the black background there, which it, it, that was required for this thing to work. You know, it, it didn't work in, in uh, more tougher living room settings, but um, that's how we could get it to work in 1995 or whatever. Okay, then um, uh, MIT invited me to join or asked me to apply and I applied and they hired me. And so then I um, came back in number 2001, I was in the AI lab there. Then for a while we uh, moved into, ran out of space and moved into temporary quarters there. So that's one lap, okay. Now <laughs> But then we keep on going um, and they built this data center where uh, my office was for many years. And then just recently we got this huge uh, influx of a uh, donation uh, for, to start a college of computing and they built a college of computing building. And that just went up and I, just two weeks ago, uh, many of the computer vision people all moved into the college of computing building. So that's where I am now. Um, and here's me. Give me a demo. Um, I just want to brag just briefly. Here's a snapshot of me with my students. This is a really strong set of students. So there's Katie Bauman, um, uh, there's Daniel Zorn, who is now a researcher at DeepMind. Uh, Katie's a faculty at Caltech. Uh, he's the person with our back, back to it is faculty at Hong Kong University of Technology. Um, uh, Tali Deppel's faculty at Weizmann, and Chai Ping Wu's faculty at Stanford. Um, so that was a particularly outstanding set of students. Um, and I do computer vision, computer graphics. Now you notice astronomy is not on the list, but I love astronomy. I'm like, I'm like a tourist in astronomy. Um, and so it's a real pleasure to come here. Um, and then I did something bad. I started working at Google um, also. So I have two jobs. I have MIT, I work at Google. I don't recommend it. Um, but it's a weird world now. Computer vision is now a data hungry, compute hungry field. And I thought it would make sense to go to the belly of the beast and work at Google for a while and see what, um, you know, take advantage of the computational and the data resources that they have. So for every year for the past eight years now, I said, okay, this is, this is the last year I'm gonna leave soon, but I haven't done it yet, but um, I keep pledging to. I mean, it, it's just the fact of having two jobs, it's not a good idea. Um, um, so, but the Google team is really strong also. And just to show you one thing that we do there, and I bet I forgot about the sound. Um, is there sound? How, what will sound there? It should work. Okay. Hey, Chef. Um, okay. So this is something that the Google group made. We call it Looking to Listen. Um, it uh, uses video to figure out what the person you're interested in is saying and uses that to filter the audio to remove the other things. So here's Indar Moseri. She's one of the prime leaders of that project. And she asked her kids to be really loud in the background. She always wants me to tell people this, that to not think that her kids misbehave in this way. But um, let's see if it works. Uh, okay, sorry, let me just really quick. I think I have to change the output. Uh, I can always lend you my kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, this will work. Let us try it. Okay, so that's what the poor Google Assistant would have to deal with if uh, if they didn't have our looking to listen thing. But but now we're going to use uh, what what she developed to filter out just her audio. Okay. Anyway, so um, that was something that we worked on and we thought that the product teams would just 
run to us, but it took like two, three years to, to get into a product, but it's in products now. So that's really cool. And on the, let's see, I think on the Pixel 7 phone, the default for the backward facing camera is to apply that to video selfies that you take. And it uses that to filter out the background and the engine and everything. Do you have a market for people who only want the kids noise? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, okay, so that's the introduction. And um, and it's now I want to talk about good uh, work I did with um, Katie Bauman and her student Bertie Feng over at Caltech. Now I gotta say they invited me in on this project a little, somewhat late into it. I am a co-author on it, but really it's mostly them. Okay, just to be clear on that. Um, all right. So image priors. Um, Almost all type of imaging it involves prior assumptions about the images that you're expecting in the world. And just to really drive that point home, you suppose you take uh, an iPhone like this and take a picture of that lake scene. You might think, well, there, it's so much, it's so data rich. There's no role of image priors there, but actually that's not true. The, the data falls on the center, looks something like that. It's actually, it's a, probably more in a Bayer, Bayer pattern, but just for simplicity, we'll assume it's RGB sampled in columns. And so this is the data. And it makes a huge difference what you assume about the world, what your photograph would look like. If you assume that red, green, and blue pixels are independent in the world, you get this reconstruction. Um, the, these very fine black and white details um, show up as color artifacts because one of the color Sample sees it, but the neighbors don't, and it's interpreted as color rather than black and white. But if you assume that the RGB pixels are correlated in the world, as indeed they are, then your smart camera will make an interpretation like this. So here's one extreme where you have so much data, how could priors possibly matter, but they do. And it seems to me that astronomical imaging is, is kind of at the other end, where you're always really data, constrained on data and um, priors really matter. And it seems to me further that the Event Horizon Telescope is just an extreme version even of that. And um, so this was, as uh, we mentioned, I had, I had peripheral involvement, mostly through Katie, um, but it was one of my favorite things to be involved in. And um, led by Shep. Um, so you have just, uh, the, the, what I think of as little tiny wisps of data. So you have uh, your radio telescopes scattered over the globe. Uh, at the time, there were eight of them. And each pair of telescopes gives you one spatial frequency in what you're looking at. And then the Earth rotates as you look in the sky. So over the course of observing evening, you get an, an elliptical um, contour in the Fourier domain. So here is um, Fourier plane. And for each of the observing nights in 2017, where they looked at um, uh, in the sky, these are the Fourier, Fourier frequencies that were measured. And this is just a little bit of what, you know, what an image is. And, and the game is, given those data points, what's the rest of it look like? What does the whole image reconstruction look like? Um, and and um, so to ask, so to, to solve this problem, you just have to use image priors. And it's such a beautiful philosophical problem. I always enjoyed it. You know, what do you use as an image prior for an image that's never been seen by anyone before? And um, so we're going to kind of look into that a little bit. Um, here, this is again, if you just do the, the first thing that would come to your mind and say, well, let's pretend that these things I observed was all there was to the image and everything else, I just happened to get it just right, and everything else is actually zero. What does that reconstructed image look like? Well, it looks terrible, um, as you might expect. And so you have to make some assumptions about what's not being measured in order to come up with any kind of reasonable image at all. Um, and so uh, that's the name of the game for the, for the kind of last half of the event horizon telescope imaging. How do you go from the uh, samples to a reasonably good reconstruction? And um, it's embarrassing to say this in front of Jeff, but uh, this eventual project, but. Um, the, the researchers did a great job of, of uh, doing the best they could with this very difficult task of coming up with priors. So the first day, they split into four teams that weren't allowed to talk with each other, and they, they each used their own prior, and they came up with an image. 
And then, okay, and then that, that showed the basic structure that was uh, the ring structure. And then they, they split into three different teams and uh, again, had everything was different between the teams. There was a different pipeline and different priors used. Um, and in some sense, that was the best thing to do at that time because you just really wanted to be sure that no matter how you put the things back together, you got the same science out. And so that's what they did. Everything was changed from one to another, but it didn't, um, one thing that we think, you know, it's appropriate to do now is to ask, well, suppose you just pick one particular imaging pipeline and just freeze everything and just change the priors at the very end. What's the impact of that on the reconstructed images? And so that's what we're going to look at in this work. So we, and again, um, so we, we're going to freeze the imaging pipeline. We're going to freeze the mechanism that, that learns priors from a set of images. So we'll pick a particular one and just change these uh, shoe boxes full of images. Um, so we're going to have four different shoe boxes full of images, and we're going to put them into this learning-based prior that, that looks at all the images and forms a prior and then puts them in the rest of the pipeline. So everything's frozen except just the images that go in uh, into the prior generating machine. Okay, any questions about that or comments? Um, and, and again, I just want to stress, um, they kind of brought me, well, so we had early conversations about this, and then they went off and did everything, and then they kind of brought me in late. So I, I am a co-author, but it's really, I'm, I'm talking about uh, Katie and Berthy's work. I'm not professional in computer science, so I, I want to ask a question. What is freeze? Oh, sorry, freeze means uh, just fix it and don't change it. Uh, it's just very informal. Yeah. Okay. Are, are you, are you um, enforcing some kind of uh, like spectral distribution of spatial frequencies in these shoeboxes, or is no. very, very different shoeboxes? Yeah, very different shoeboxes. That's, that's what I'm going to tell you right now. What are the three, four shoeboxes? So, um, and you can imagine the spectrum. You know, you can you can say, I want to assume Einstein was right and give the uh, shoebox full of images of, of basically simulations of um, general relativistic magneto hydrodynamics. Um, and that's actually one of the shoeboxes. So, um, this is one set of images that we used. There were 100,000 images from uh, GRNHD simulations of Sag A star, uh, not, the, not the black hole we're looking at, but a different one, um, resized 64 square pixels and scaled in certain ways. So we didn't fix exactly what the size of the ring was. And this is the sort of very bottom there is the reference that we got this from. And it uses the so-called Petroka pipeline uh, within the Event Horizon Telescope Simulation Library. So that's one where you just assume Einstein is right. Um, there's another set um, also of, uh, of um, models of, of black holes. This one is called radiatively inefficient accretion flow. And I'd love if you could actually explain you know, what this one is about. If you, um, I, I'm not as familiar with it, but um, this is another one they picked. They use 10,000 images from these simulations. They have a different visual character, but they're also models of, of black hole images. Um, is there more to say? I guess, so one thing is that the prior seems to simplify the present model of oh, black no. holes. <laughs> this is more of a model of uh, the accretion flow, really popularized by Ramesh and his group, Ramesh Narayan here, okay. which is uh, the relatively inefficient accretion flow, which is like a hot coffee flow. Okay. And it's it's not uh, a full simulation, it's more of a model. Okay. Um, I should repeat that. It's it's not a full simulation. It's a model, um, and um, so this was another one. So it's got it's got some assumptions about black holes built in, but not all assumptions. Okay, so this, those are two at one extreme. Now let's use kind of more general images. So here's one we use. The third shoe box is um, this so-called CFAR ten images. Um, so. Actually, this came from images that came out of my lab earlier. We, we had an image of um, uh, image data set we call tiny images, which were all images uh, driven by, by a dictionary, 80 million tiny images, and they're all 32 squared from all different non abstract nouns in the dictionary. Then people Toronto took uh, 10 object categories from them and kind of curated them, cleaned them up, and called them CFAR 10. And so here they are. And so um, this is a this have nothing to do with black holes or even of astronomy. But the thinking is, 
gosh, there is something that all images have in common. You know, they're not random IID Gaussian noise. Maybe these would capture it and, and, and be applicable to astronomical images. So, um, so this is uh, shoe box number three, and we used uh, 45,000 of these, of these grayscale images. Um, okay. Then, now, the fourth one, let's be bad, okay? Let's use an image data set that we know is not right and, and just see what impact that has on uh, the reconstruction of the black hole. Let's use so-called celeb A data set. So there's a, a, a data set of, of celebrities' faces, and they're celebrities because um, it's okay to kind of show them publicly. They have the assumption of uh, being a public figure. And so um, there, we used 160,000 uh, images like these, and they're all registered to the eyes. So they're really fairly um, constrained. It's pretty constrained prior of faces of celebrities viewed close up. Okay, that's shoe box number four. And um, so here, and, and so we, we take these color images and resize them, and here they are uh, all resized the way they go into the um, deep learning based prior learning machine uh, CFR10, GRNHD, RIAF, and Celeb A. Okay, so um, now, so let's. Uh, now, now we've got our shoe boxes. Now we have to go and do, do a learning based prior. And um, I gotta say, you know, I've been around for a while in research and you get to watch these things come and go. I, I feel a little bit like my field is like, like the main character in this movie, Memento. Have any of you seen that movie, Memento? It's about someone who has no short-term memory, no long-term, only short-term memory. And um, so that's what my field is like. Here's a kind of a little, some different image priors that have come and gone. Um, we used to really love patch-based priors. Um, and so you could form images of, you know, um, rice and Parmesan cheese driven by my face in this example using patch-based priors. And they're, they're pretty good and everyone loved them for a while. They, they were all the rage in the graphics community. Then they were taken over as everything was taken over by deep learning based methods. Um, so these, let's see what's wrong with these. Well, they, they don't quite generalize in the way that deep learning does. Um, so for a while, everyone was very excited about so-called GAN-based image priors. These are uh, generative adversarial networks. You have uh, two different networks, one which is tasked with making up images and another which is tasked at deciding whether the images that one made is fake or whether, whether it's drawn from the shoebox of real images. And so you have this, this competitive game where first you have the, the image generator is really lousy and the image discriminator are really lousy, but they gradually get better and better in synchrony with each other. And, and, and you get a, um, a, a really strong model of images as a result. So these are all GAN-based image generations. And so what's wrong with this one? Well, as you can imagine from this description of these two things getting better at the same time, uh, they're kind of finicky and they don't always get better at the same time. And, um, there's sort of trouble to work with, but they were very popular for a while. Then around 2021, uh, people discovered or rediscovered uh, diffusion-based image generation. And so this is an um, example from mid-journey. So they're used all over the place now. They're usually combined with these large language models so you can say some words and get an image that, that matches what you said in, in just astonishing detail. Uh, an astonishingly detailed image. And um, and so this is all the rages that everyone's using, and so we'll use this now. I just give this history to say that maybe three years from now, I'm not gonna promise that we're gonna use the same image prior model, but that's what everyone uses now. Um, and so how do these diffusion models work? Well, it's a kind of cute idea. The, the thinking is, uh, even though no one really says this, but it seems to me the thinking is that it's just too hard a problem to give a shoebox of images to a single neural network and say, okay, go learn the prior model for this. You know, it's just too, too big a leap to suddenly generate the full image. And instead they, they kind of break it down with divide and conquer. So you take an image and you just keep on adding Gaussian random noise to it. And you get this, everyone knows this is easy to deal with. This is IID Gaussian random noise. The thing that where it's breaking into little steps is we're gonna learn how to go from this back to that. 
And um, so that's the game. You, we're going to train a neural network model to go from this to this. And maybe, okay, we can't afford a neural network. We can't right away generate a full image, but maybe you can do this. And then we're going to train a different neural network to go from this to this. And then we're going to train a different one to do this and this. And uh, all the way down, back down the pipeline. And it turns out that works. It works really astonishingly well. And um, there's uh, math, you know, with it. It it's, um, relates to um, stochastic differential equations. So here's the forward model where you keep on adding Gaussian random noise to your image. Get the next example of your image. And um, it turns out from stochastic differential equation theory that you can put this in reverse if you know what this function is or learn what this function is. This is called a score function. And it tells you, you know, that's got the prior probability for your image in it. And um, so I think this reverse stochastic differential equation approach was, was known for some time. And this guy, Yang Song at Stanford, was the one who wrote these papers in particular, which just uh, caught everyone's attention. And they started using these all over the place. Um, so how do we differ from that? So most of the ways people have used this really involves basically putting your likelihood term right into the reverse, uh, reverse diffusion equations uh, all the way through. And we were careful to modularize this thing. So you'd have a prior, which is separate from the likelihood, and you could uh, manipulate them independently. And then I should point out, there, there are other people who would probably say, we did that too. And some of those people include uh, Mickey Alad and Pengen Nulantar and um, my graduate school, Oxnay, Eros and Michelli. So the other people are working in similar ways. Oh, but, sorry, can I ask you, so this measurement likelihood, if you have something like a face, what does the likelihood function look like for that? Um, let's see. Well, it, it's, it would be, uh, you might have some measurements and you would say that your face reconstruction has to have some squared error, some small squared difference from that template, for example. That would be. Okay, so you have some sort of a model of what a face looks like. And yeah. Priors on the parameters of the model and you're trying to conform with those. Right. And and what I mean, that's what I'm just saying. I'm sort of contrasting what um, other people aren't as careful about separating out the likelihood between the prior in their reconstructions. And that's kind of what we're bringing to it. Um, yeah. So, um, so, so then this lets us then uh, have our shoebox and and then come out with the machine, which which does two things. You can draw more samples from things that have the same prior as the shoebox full images, and you can also put in an image and get out a number for how probable it is, uh, log probability, under this prior. So um, if you train down faces, you might expect that this one would have high numbers, from lower, and this one lower still. Um, so so we wrote a paper at the last fall's International Conference on Computer Vision where we um, explored this, but not on real data. But um, it's it's pretty fun and cool. So here's, we used um, simulated data from uh, radio interferometry with three, four, and five telescopes. We used um, the Celebe data set as our model of images. And then we looked at reconstructions from a Pretending that the likelihood term was a um, uh, a black hole source uh, with a simulated black hole, and so here's the okay, case so of three, four, and five telescopes. This is not much data, a little more data, a little more data. When you have not much data, the reconstruction you get looks like face, as it would have to, because it's kind of defaulting to the prior. And if you add more data, then it begins to look a little more like our simulated uh, source in the sky. Let's see, and then, um, so, so uh, actually, Berthi, yeah, this is a collaboration of um, Berthi as a summer intern at Google, and, and Katie was involved too, and then those two went off and noted that, gee, it takes a long time to run this uh, diffusion-based image prior, and so they came up with a variation method 
which does it much more quickly. And so I wasn't involved in that work, but here's uh, showing what they could do. Um, so here's, let's see. So here's the exact, doing the exact computation, how long it takes to uh, make an image of a certain size. And it's really any place low, 39 hours, 43 hours, 100 hours. And using their variational method, which basically introduces um, uh, functions of, of a certain parameter family that you fit to uh, your results. And it's not exact, it's bound on what the um, results should look like. This is the surrogate, and that works much, much faster. So, um, so we use their efficient but approximate technique for image generation to do these experiments I'm about to show you. Okay, so 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 we got a four few boxes. Let's put them through um, two things. Let's put them through simulated uh, data from uh, the Event Horizon Telescope and then real data. So um, okay, so here are different uh, simulated objects in the sky: uh, ring, a crescent, uh, a doublet, uh, disc, elliptical, point plus ellipse, and uh, two different simulated. Um, Simulations of a black hole. And then we have our four priors. This is the CFAR 10. This is generic images. And this is a, a strict um, uh, simulation of a black hole, believing Einstein to be correct. Here's the RIAF, the more approximate model of a black hole. Um, and here's, uh, you know, Celeb A, uh, basically. How much data is here? Like, is this like the EAT or the one in 2017? Yeah. Um, so let's see. Oh, yeah. So, um, okay. So, general observations CFAR 10 is, is kind of a pretty good uh, toolkit for, for most any of these images. It does okay, on, it doesn't really screw up in a big way on, on, on any of these. And then the these, GRMHD simulation just sees, um, you know, crescents with shadows of black holes in everything it looks at. So it looks at this disk and sees a uh, shadow of a black hole. It looks at this elliptical one, sees a shadow of a black hole, as you would expect it would, because that's what it's, that's what it thinks the world is all about. Um, this other, uh, the RIAF model is um, a little better about filling in a disk when it should be filled in. Okay, and then Celebe. Celebe does remarkably well. <laughs> They're just training on human faces. So, um, I mean, it, well, okay, so these, these pairs of images is to indicate that actually the, the, the posterior was multimodal. So these are sampling from the two different modes that were found. And one thing that's kind of cute is when it has a disc, lots of times it devotes one of the eyes of a celebrity to the disc. And it puts oh. it there. Um, you'll see that several times in these, um, like down here maybe too. Um, is there anything else you can say? So, is it fair to say that we could get a lot more data? We could double the number of dishes. Yeah. All these differences start to go away. Yeah, I think so. And and you can see that fact uh, in a small way. Um, we uh, later I'll show uh, results from the different observing nights, and one of the nights, I guess April tenth, has um, more data than the other nights, and you can see that effect a little bit already. Um, Bill, yeah, I just wanted to ask. I, I noticed that the double uh simulation in particular, it looks like there's a lot of um translation that happens between the different reconstructions. Hmm. And I, I was just curious if, um, if, if you could comment on that, right? Um, that's a detail that I don't know the answer to, but yeah, um, I don't know how things were centered or to what extent they were centered. Um, I have a question. I was just wondering, like, if you hypothetically trained on a mixture of CFAR 10 and GRMHD, then for something that's like the double image, do you think it would yeah, I think reconstruct it, something that's like Yeah, true? that's a good point. I, I think, um, yes, the more that you mix in together, the more flexibility you give it, therefore. And um, yeah, I think it would do better. We haven't tried that. But, um, and the, these next two slides are just close-ups of the one you just saw. Um, 
Okay, and then uh, because they're simulated, you can also look at um, how well they agree with the how well the reconstructions agreed with the uh, simulated sources. So we've calculated the normalized cross correlation. And um, let's see, I think the main result was that um, the, the, the CIFAR 10, the you know, generic images, it did, the, it did the best overall. So, so the, black, the bold ones are the, the best uh, of also the columns for each one of the rows. And if you want to, you know, a generic prior that, that handles all these things pretty well, you would think CIFAR 10, but of course, if you uh, the more you specialize, the better you do. Yes. Do you have to why GRMHC is doing better in your amazing cousins than GRMHC constricted? Wait, so, I'm sorry. So let's see. In this versus this. Yeah. Um, that's a good point. Thing. So the question was, uh, why are these numbers for how well GRMHD matches the ring and pressing simulated sources? Why are, they, why are they actually stronger than for actual GR MHP stimulated sources? Um, that's a good point. Um, so it, I don't know, just making up a guess off the top of my head. You know, possibly there's just more variability, more variability with um, these fluid simulations. And so if you just look at normalized cross correlation, they might have very similar texture, but the actual square difference would be small. Yeah, the ring and crest are like quite smooth. Yeah. It's a bit, it's a bit yeah. Smooth. Yeah. So it's it's nice. yeah. Um, and okay, still simulated data. Now we're looking at um, so so you can draw samples from the posterior and you can compute the means and covariances from the set of samples. So I think you use 128 samples to calculate these mean and covariance reconstructions from these different uh, simulated sources. So, um, right, so and we're not showing the uh, uh, survey yet. One thing I want to point out, which is I'm going to talk about a little bit later, I looked at these results and I said, ah, there's a bug, something's wrong here, you know, this cannot be right. Uh, this square has got to be an artifact somehow of the processing. Like, there's a step where they take the CPAR 10 images, or actually any of the images, and they have a mask and they Make it bigger and smaller to um, to just focus on the center part of the image and ignore the rest of it. I thought that's got to be you know what's causing this. And then Katie said, mm, "I bet it's the, the uh, CFR ten prior itself, which is going to favor horizontal and vertical structures." I said, "Ah, oh, Katie, you can't be so simplistic. That just can't be right." Okay, and, well, it'll turn out that she was right. But um, anyway, um, let's see. So what's the point here? I guess the Right, so the really strong priors have the smallest posterior uncertainty. So our IAF is a more constrained prior than the other two, and it's always pretty sure about things. This, okay, this is, you want to look at the, the scale here on this uh, standard deviation image, and it only goes up to 0 0.3, whereas the scale on the CR10, the generic images, you know, it's, it's going to let everything happen, but it's not going to be as sure about anything. So it has higher posterior variants. So do you mean that the, the priors that look like each other more? What do you mean more? Yeah. Prior? So um, yeah, so these have less, much less variability than, than these images. And so um, in the, even after the measurement, there's gonna say, well, it could be whatever, you know? And so uh, these ones will say that, whereas these, they, they've got this cookie cutter idea about what these things could be. And so they localize things more even in the posterior. Um, oh yeah, and then this is the goofy one. Uh, this is the trying to reconstruct uh, celebrity spaces from these simulated sources, and you can see right, again these these two I mean there's two modes: the posterior, and again you can see eyes becoming the center of these rings and things. Uh, okay, so here's my my concern. So this is just a subset of what I showed you before. It's only for the CFAR 10, and these are for three different things, all of which are round, and all of which get reconstructed like little tiny squares. And I just could, I just bug me. That's got to be a mistake. So we we tracked it down. So here is a subset of the CFAR 10 images, generic 32 square images of the world, and. Um, 
Here they are after you scale them and put them uh, into the inputs of the prior. And here's their average um, log power spectrum. And you know, this I, um, you always see these in Fourier transforms and images, and I often attribute them to really boundary effects in the Fourier transform calculation. But we did two different control tests. We took those images and we gave them a random affine work. So we just try to mess up any verticality or horizontality. And it, it really gets rid of those quite a bit, even though there's somewhere else. Um, this corresponds to strong horizontal lines. So I don't know, maybe the horizon comes through even if you're affine work it. I don't know. And then and then we said, okay, listen, let's just do IID Gaussian random noise, but with a one aware of power spectrum. Under a squared power spectrum. And that really uh, does it get rid of the those um, artifacts in the those that regularity in the power spectrum. And you can reconstruct using those. So here's C part 10, here's warp C part 10, and here's uh, one of F noise, one of squared noise. And the little square artifacts go, go away. And this just bugged me for a while, and then I went back and looked at the images. So, you know, I don't see any buildings here. I don't see any windows. Where does the preference for vertical and horizontal come from? Well, it comes from gravity, really. There's, um, <laughs> there's just a lot of, you know, there's horizons there, and then there are things standing up against gravity. So you got these vertical legs. Um, and it's just, uh, you know, I learned something from this project, uh, you know, among other things, it was that there indeed is, even in natural images, there's a strong preference for horizontal and vertical. Who knew? Can you say why you think intuitively one over x square works? <clears throat> um, yeah, so that's like image prior matter <laughs> around the mid 1970s, 1980s. Everyone, you know, did Fourier transforms of images and they just always found it, it's really almost rock solid. It, all sorts of images have that same power spectrum. Um, what's it from? Let's see, I think you can model it if you. Use a so called dead leaves model of images where you throw down randomly shaped segments one on top of each other as if they were leaves falling on the ground, and you get these sharp edges, and, um, uh, and, and you get that scaling. Um, also, perspective helps to get that scaling. A lot of little things far away, and then big things close up. Um, but it, it's a really very reliable attribute of natural images. Um, okay, then let's uh, try to analyze features from these simulated data. This, okay, we're still in simulations. I won't go into this too much, but um, for the simulated signals, all the choices of the prior roughly recover the target diameter or repetition asymmetry. Uh, this RIAF prior overestimates the diameter uh, of, of a GRNHD signal. Um, so let's move on to real data. Yes. Uh, regarding to using different faces, like you said, every teaser, and others to do the reconstruction, I have a question. So, uh, if you were able to infinitely increase the number of the telescopes and you were just considering those elliptical, you know, ring that you actually showed us, was there any chances that a celebrity can actually recover it? Because to my sense, there is it's just completely wrong, right? So, yeah, yeah. Especially for that particular model, I feel like there is no hope that you could just increase it further than 50%. That was 43%, the one that you showed, or like, could that be any possibility to go above 80% or so for that well, right. thing? So, so the question was, what if you just really increase the likelihood term, just really, really make the data, the data more and more reliable and more, and more complete, uh, and you still use this terribly wrong prior, um, well, we haven't actually run that particular experiment, but I believe what would happen mm -hmm. is the prior would say, well, this is a really unlikely uh, portion of my prior probability space, but the likelihood is so sure of it, I think it's going to be this. I mean, it'll. that's what happens in kind of simpler systems where you have Gaussians fighting each other. Uh, so I think it would just go to the likelihood, They'd go to the data. Uh, and it would just say this is a really unlikely probability, but if you say so, if you saw this, uh, you know, high resolution image of a black hole, I, even though it doesn't look like a celebrity, that's probably what we saw. I think that's what it's going to, uh, the math will, will say. I would argue that that image is a celebrity. Right. That's right. <laughs> um, okay, so let's move on to real data. Um, so this is from um, 
the different observing nights in 2017. And um, as this is kind of a summary of things, we've got different strengths of priors. And uh, you could say, you know, Einstein was correct. Here's a simulation of it. And, or you could say, well, I don't know what's going to be there. Let's see what might come about. And we plugged in our three different, this is just for the non Soleve shoeboxes of images, generic images, GRMHD, and RIAF. And you get these three, these are um, samples from the posterior, it's not the mean of the posterior, but samples from it. Um, and uh, all these three different tires indeed show a ring structure, they show, show the asymmetry, um, and the ring is approximately the same size as well. Can but let's do it in more detail. Something? Yeah. So, sorry, I'm, I'm no expert on either the, the science or the methods here, but what the message I'm getting here is that your your final image still depends strongly on the prior, given the current level of data. I don't know how much you will be adding soon, but uh, so whatever changes you measure in an image will depend on assumption, assumptions on the priors, for example, the magnet hydrodynamic simulation. What is the level of data amount that we need before we infer that and anything physical we're trying to measure from the black hole, for example, spin or dynamics, is not strongly influenced influenced by the prior. In other words, what if what it's actually in M87 is not a supermassive black hole? Does that make sense to you? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, they uh, the the team explored that rather carefully, and um, I, I think all and even these results also will support that there is just strong evidence that there is a, a, a crescent with a with a dark spot in the center with asymmetry. Um, all those features hold regardless of what the um, prior assumptions are in images. If you have a really pathological set of images like the Celeb A, you still see a ring structure. It's like one of the eyes of these celebrities, um, but it, it's still there. And so, um, I mean, I, I think I think it's still, I don't know, I mean, you have to, before you really believe it's a black hole, I think you have to use a very generic prior like this type to, to do the imaging. And that's indeed what was done in the 2019 papers. Um, it wasn't exactly this prior, but it was a very generic prior that made no assumptions about the physics. And, and they reconstructed the, the ring. And then if you say, well, I think it's, I'm gonna use my general relativistic magnetohydrodynamic simulation and see what I get there. And you get this really beautiful high res, you know, thin ring. But of course, you're, you're putting that in, so it's, um, you know, if we believe Einstein, well, that probably is what's there, but but you can't really say that unless you are sure. Can, can you go back to the other? I just want to say one thing here. It's important to note that the leftmost image there is would be the weakest prior. Right. So the, the priors that were actually used for the imaging are yeah. the absolute weakest. You, they, they don't have much structure of the you know, positivity, for example. You enforce that the image has to be real. That, that, that kind of thing. Very slightly smooth. So these are extremely mild priors. Non informative. Yeah. So, so the, 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 we're very confident of that ring structure. Right. And, and yeah. Yeah, Bill is the expert here. We also looked at that the non ring sources yeah. we covered them precisely. I guess more than the, just the ring structure, I'm wondering about small changes in the image when different physics happen and how much detail we can recover. But I guess that's a very long discussion. We can I, I, yeah, I was wondering also if, you know, the black hole is definitely there because you recovered whatever, but then if you use the GRMHT prior, it might be give you a better shot at even not thinking that Einstein was right and thinking, okay, there's a correction to general relativity, hmm. but we use the, the right prior that is something similar and then we see a small deviation from, from what you would get with a GRMHD? Is that something that would make sense to test how different it is from the simulations to use that prior and see if you get okay. something slightly different? Um, I mean, uh, perhaps, I guess. Uh, so one thing I'm gonna show later are um, you know, chi-squared tests of the uh, measurements. And that would be one way of analyzing that. Um, um, let's see. So yeah, I, I, in principle, you could do that. I, I, to, to, to find these really subtle differences, um, you probably need more data than from that initial run. Um, let's see. So 
what do I say about the X? Um, okay, so the, the, the CIFAR-10 trained on everyday images, it still sees a ring structure. The GRMHD sees a nice narrow ring structure, but of course you're sort of baking that in. The RIA structure prior um, has a, you know, it kind of has an output that reflects a little bit those characteristics of the prior. And then the celebrities, uh, again, these are, um, these are, I think these are, these are samples from the posterior and not, so they're a little bit more noisy than the reconstructions in the published 2019 papers because these are just samples from a posterior as opposed to a mean. Um, but these, again, you can kind of, it's funny, you can sort of see a little bit of the celebrity face now, you can also see a little bit of the ring structure of the black hole. Um, okay, and then, sorry. Uh, for this work, we, um, so it's not exactly true that you, you measure the Fourier uh, components along those points in, um, in the Fourier plane because of uh, variations and noise at each of the different telescopes and unknown atmospheric conditions above each of the telescopes. So instead, uh, radio astronomers use um, data products that they call closure phase and um, other closure quantities that are if you, if you take a if you um, if you take a triangle of telescopes and go from here to here to here to here to here to here, you should come up with the same phase uh, as as you started from, and that that constraint um, generates a, a a more robust data signal that that is robust against these unknown variations in the atmosphere. So we can look at um, the data consistency metrics for those um, kind of noise robust uh, closure quantities. And this is the chi squared we're printing in this, we're pointing out in this array of numbers. Sorry for the visual texture here, but um, values near, so we took 128 samples and computed the average for the chi squared for these different observing dates. Um, I squared about one indicates a good balance of the observed data and prior, and um, the higher ones, let's see, so the really constrained prior, the RIAF, has a higher chi squared because the prior is sort of pulling the data away from where it wants to be based on, on observations. So that shows up in this column, these being significantly higher than the other columns. And um, these are means and standard deviations of posterior samples from the observing nights. This is, again, real data. So they took, uh, I think, again, 128 samples to create these mean and standard deviation images. Oh, yeah, and then again, the standard deviations are um, lower in the very constrained priors where the, where the the posterior is also therefore a little bit more constrained, whereas this more agnostic prior uh, has a broader uh, broader peaks in the posterior, reflecting the um, higher scale here for the standard deviation. Mm -hmm. Could you kind of look at the brightness and the orange ones and divide it by Right. in that same pixel, the brightness and the, ah, the ratio of like signal to noise ratio, mm. these are like a confidence in, in like each individual pixel in the mm. like, like 10 divided by one into the S and huh. right. Yeah, maybe I, I, that seems reasonable. Okay, maybe, 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 maybe I'm not saying anything more than what you see in the green view, which is just the uncertainty on a per pixel base. Yeah, so the GRMHD higher says, I think it's like this, I'm pretty sure of it. Um, whereas the, the, the CIFAR-10 sees the same uh, scale on the on the image, but is much less sure of it. I think that's fair, actually. Does it mean anything particularly that the uh, scale of the standard deviation seems much lower for the uh, re compared to 
GRMHD compared to CPAR 10. Right, yeah, that's the, um, uh, right, so I, I think it is significant. And and the, the reasoning that we have in the paper is that the REAP is, um, is a more constrained prior. So it's it says, I think everything's here in the parameter space and, and that's in the prior, but then that locality of the prior is also gonna carry through to the posterior and give you a more localized space. So it's pretty sure of things. Whereas the CFR 10 is quite agnostic about what the image can be. And that's also reflected in the posterior. Um, okay, and then let's look at the reconstructions of real black hole data, assuming that there's celebrities in the sky. And um, uh, here's the, the thing I was referring to before. You get multimodal uh, two peaks on the posterior, except for the observing night of April 11th, sorry, uh, when it's a little more localized. And this, um, I'm told, uh, the, the data was, uh, there's more, more telescope coverage for this night than for the other nights. Um, so the only single mode posterior for this look for this lily fire is on that night when there was the most data. So so then the likelihood's going to do a little do what it can to overcome the prior and give you um, a better reconstruction. Excuse me. Oh, yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. It's a bit. It's a question about. Uh, I wonder, does the performance of your, uh, you know, machine learning algorithm would also depend on which data product you use? Like, if you use the closure phase or closure amplitude or visibility amplitude or anybody else, would that affect, you know, how much you're going to recover or how much easier would that be for your network to work? Um. um I don't think. Well, I don't. We haven't tried it. I don't know uh, how that would affect things. I, I, I don't think it would change the conclusions much. I mean, so just because we have to close up, um, we can also use the different priors to look at the science. Look at you know what what is the expected um, uh, diameter of, of the ring and the orientation of it and the width of it. And um, the answer is it doesn't change very much with the different priors, which is great. I mean, the celebre, it changes with that, but not with the others. And so that's also um, in this paper, we have um, the results to see all the priors agree on a range of possible diameters, roughly between 35 and 48 micro arc seconds. This is consistent with the original imaging results, um, although with higher uncertainty, especially under the celebre based prior. But that's, I think, reassuring. And then let me just close with the last slide. So we think this is an exercise one should go through for scientific imaging problems. So we recommend a stage where you freeze everything, don't change it, and just change your image prior assumptions and see how that changes your conclusions. Um, we use learned diffusion model images for prior image priors, um, and we had these four different shoe boxes and, and ran through the system and see how that changed uh, the science that came out. So, and that, I guess the main finding is that they, 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 it doesn't change the science too much for these reasonable choices between priors. If you use a slow A prior, it does change it. So, um, anyway, let's eat, I guess. <laughs> Discussions over lunch. We're going to have lunch at the lobby. So, just one last time, I want to reflect. Yes. This is primarily the work of Tiffany Fang and Yuki. We've got one question on there. Oh, okay. Uh, can I see it or hear it? Or? Uh, you should be able to. So, go ahead. Hi. Thank you for this wonderful talk. Very, very interesting, of course. Uh, I, I just wanted to say that I put in the chat the link for a very interesting and I think very important paper by Sam Grala, I don't know if you are familiar with this paper, in which he says, you know, that, that these data cannot be used to test general relativity. I'm saying this because it was brought up beforehand. So while this is extremely interesting, of course, as you have made very clear, it's very important 
to know our limitations here. So this is just something I wanted to say. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, great, thanks.